please introduce yourself to everybody and uh, let us know what you're going to be presenting. Thank you. Okay, sure. Um, so I'm Phil Metzger, and by the way, can I switch back to seeing me for a second? You know how to... There we go. So okay. hi, I'm Phil Metzger, Dr. Phil Metzger. I work for NASA at the Kennedy Space Center, and I run the Granular Mechanics and Regolith Operations Lab. We develop technologies for mining in space, and we also develop technologies for um, construction in space, for utilizing resources that are mined and um, obtained in space so that we can make space exploration more affordable. And we also hope to spin off our technologies to commercial mining companies. So I'll be talking about rapidly starting space industry and solar system civilization. So do you want me to just go ahead and begin? Yep, beautiful. Okay, great. Okay, so um, rapidly starting space industry and solar system civilization. So uh, I'll back Earlier in the previous century, the Russian astronomer Kardashev was looking for extraterrestrial civilizations, looking for radio signals in space. And he was pointing out to his colleagues that you couldn't necessarily assume that all extraterrestrial civilizations would be sending out similar signals to us because they might not be at the same level. And so he came up with this scale of civilizations, and he defined a type 1 civilization as one that uses the energy of an entire planet. A type 2 civilization is one that uses the energy of an entire star. And a type 3 is one that uses that of an entire galaxy. And um, what I want to do is use his scale to look at where we've already been so that it'll help to put into perspective where we are right now and what we need to be about. So let's start counting backwards from type 1. We could define a type 0 civilization is one that has filled out an entire continent. And what they would find at the boundaries of their civilization is that they've got oceans that are difficult to cross. And so it's very similar to spaceflight today. We're, we're at the... Um, the point of talking about crossing the oceans of space and we describe our vehicles as ships because of the analogy to ocean crossing. Going back even further you could say type minus one would be a river valley because that's where civilization began when people figured out how to use a unique energy resource. It was using the silt of the river flood deposits to grow grain crops and then using animal and human labor to do the agriculture. And it became a closed system because the people doing the work were also living on the resources that their work produced. And so once they developed this technology, the civilization began, and then it rapidly filled out the river valley networks. And, um, well, the Tigris and Euphrates, River Valley, the Nile, the Indus, and the Yellow River were the four cradles of civilization in the old world. and um, But once they filled out those river valleys, they couldn't really go beyond those areas with civilization because their, their energy source was limited to those regions where they could do that sort of agriculture. And so they had to develop okay, the ability to um, set up logistics networks and a system of forts to guard the caravans hauling large quantity of grains out of their river valleys to the rest of the continents. And so, for example, during the height of the Roman Empire, which was a type zero civilization filling out a continent, they were hauling barges of grain across from Egypt. So developing the technologies to haul resources from the little islands where they existed uh, made it possible to go to the next level. And if you want to go even further back, you could say a type minus two would be before civilization even began when people were living in isolated enclaves as hunter-gatherers. So um, I want to make some predictions. We are essentially a type 1 right now. If you want to be really precise, um, Carl Sagan said that we're, uh, he, he turned it into a logarithmic scale and he said that we're actually a type 0 0.7, not quite type 1. But I don't think we're going to get much closer to a type 1 than we are right now. And really what Kardashev meant by type 1 was a planet-scale civilization, a global civilization, and we are essentially that. And I think we've got about 50 to 100 years to leap the barrier and become a type 2. 
And if we don't, we might never ever do it. And I'll explain why. But if we do achieve a type 2 civilization, then I bet you going to type 3 would actually be much easier and faster than you would expect. Um, now, there are a number of global issues that we're dealing with. One of them is energy, for example, and uh, other, other ones are pollution related, like people are concerned about the carbon in the atmosphere affecting the planet on a global scale. There are concerns about overcrowding, about food, and um, all of these global problems, I want to make a claim, are related to the same root cause. And that is that we have become a type 1 civilization. We are nearing the limits of a type 1 civilization. And as you approach that limit, you find out that it's not a smooth transition going on to the next level. And so we're starting to feel the squeeze of the barrier at the end of a type 1 civilization. And we've got to leap that barrier if we're going to continue growing. Um, now, this chart that shows the energy availability is out of date because of advances in fracking technology. And they say that with fracking, we now have enough energy to last for 100 years. But that's assuming that we continue spending energy at the rate that we currently are. However, the world's population is expected to more than double over the next 50 years. And the entire world is wanting to industrialize and achieve a Western standard of living. And they're well on their way toward that. So China, for example, has the largest population. They are now the world's largest energy user. And yet they're still only using one-fourth as much energy per person that we are. So they have room to grow by a factor of four. And they're already the world's largest energy user. India is also growing and, and um, industrializing. And so in order for the whole world to achieve the current Western standard of living and double in population, more than double, we could have five to ten times the energy use in the future, which means that this hundred years of energy supply would really only last ten to twenty years if we were already at that energy rate. So, so um, we may discover more sources of energy here on the planet, but as uh, time goes on, we're going to continue to feel this squeeze unless we can get beyond the barrier of a single planet. So what I want to claim is that we don't really have a resource problem. We're living in an incredibly rich solar system with billions of times everything that we have here on planet Earth. So all we really have is an imagination problem because we haven't imagined how to go about getting things that are off planet. And so we tend to discount that possibility and don't factor it into our calculations. People will say, think globally, but act locally. Well, that's OK, but I want to say that really the problem is thinking globally. And we need to, um, thinking globally is the new way of thinking too small. We need to think beyond globally if we want to find the solution. Because the, the problem is that we are confined to a globe right now. Um, other people will say outside the box, but let's think of that in terms of thinking outside the sphere. The problem is that Earth's surface is curved in on itself, and so it's a finite amount of surface area. And the only other direction we've got to go is perpendicularly outward from the surface into space. Uh, people have a hard time imagining doing this because it's a paradigm shift. And people tend to just extrapolate small amounts from where they currently are. If you thought what it must have been like to be a Polynesian back before the English first arrived in their big ships, they were living on volcanic islands that did not have any source of metal. And so their, their civilization was limited by that resource. And they could only achieve a certain amount of technology without metal. And suddenly one day, these giant ships with cannons and nails and such, things that were made in factories were metal and uh, the ability to control uh, furnaces and steam started to come visit their civilization. And it was a shock. It would be even more of a shock if they had been visited by aircraft carriers or big container ships like we have today. In the, in the days before Western civilization arrived in the Pacific, it was a heroic journey to cross the ocean. But now, if you look at the mouse that's on the computer there on the desk, that mouse probably cost five or ten dollars, and yet the materials in that mouse crossed the ocean five or six times. The plastic came from oil, which was from Saudi Arabia. 
Maybe it was refined in the United States. The metal and the wires probably came from South Africa. It might have been re um, refined in Japan. The computer chips were made maybe in Arizona. The whole thing was assembled in China, and then it was shipped across the ocean again and sold here for $10. So economically, we're crossing the ocean like no problem at all. So the things that seemed impossible in the past are now so easy, it's trivial. And you've got to realize that that's the way the future is going to be. Things that seem impossible, like having an economy that spans between the planets, is someday very soon going to be actually trivial. Back in the 90s, Gerard K. O'Neill, who was a physicist at, I think he was at Princeton, was doing studies about how to do industry in space. And at the time, he was not factoring in what robotics could mean for it. And so he was looking at having humans living in big platforms in space doing the manufacturing based on lunar resources. And he calculated it would take 10,000 people living in a spinning cylinder like this in order for them to have enough people to become economic and start making a profit. And the idea was that they would capture, let me go back, they would capture solar energy and beam it down to Earth for sale on Earth. And that's how they would get a revenue stream in order to buy things from the Earth. Well, 10,000 people was how many you needed before it would start to make a profit. And nobody was willing to invest enough money to build this gargantuan space station without um, making money along the way. And so, of course, it couldn't possibly have happened. It was not something that the people of the Earth or the Congresses of the world were willing to do on risk. In 1980, the Ames Research Center of NASA out in California did a study about how to bring that cost down using robotics. And so they said, let's make self-replicating lunar factories where one factory will build three more and those will each build three more. And pretty soon you'll have a giant industry on the moon that can make anything that we want. They'll just start out making more factories until that it scales up as large as we need it to be to, to then start serving the Earth. And they, they fleshed it out in quite a bit of detail and they determined that a factory would have solar cell makers, it would have excavators, you can see those in the foreground at the bottom of the picture. It would have um, all kinds of factory equipment and robots driving around assembling things and chemical processing plants, extracting the various elements out of the lunar soil. They, um, they decided that they weren't going to try to achieve full closure, so some of the pieces were too hard to make on the moon. Those would be shipped from the Earth and they would make things on the moon to sell back to the earth in order to make it worthwhile to ship all these missing pieces. And so without achieving full closure, they estimated it would take about 100 tons of hardware. And so you would have to build all this hardware, get it working on earth, and then launch it all, all 100 tons to the moon, put it together, and then it would start to replicate. But even 100 tons sent to the moon back in the 1980s was too expensive and it seemed too fanciful and really the technologies weren't quite available yet. And so it was never acted upon. Well, since that time we've had a number of game changers. For example, robotics is now blooming. Bill Gates, the founder of Microsoft, said that robotics today is at the place where personal computing was in 1980. That was at the beginning of the computer revolution and so he's predicting there's going to be a robotics revolution. Pretty soon we're all going to have robots in our houses just like on all the science fiction shows. That day is almost here. Another thing is computing. In order to make robotics really functional, to make it more autonomous, we need better computers, more powerful computers to do the artificial intelligence. They need to be shrunk down to fit onto a mobile platform. And the predictions are that we're going to have sufficient computing in maybe 10 or 20 years to have fairly autonomous robotics walking around. Another game changer is additive manufacturing. This is really important because if you want to have a robotic industry, then everything needs to be very simple as an automated process. And additive manufacturing has dramatically simplified the manufacturing process. These are some things that are now being made by additive manufacturing, things that can't be made by any other method. Also, entire houses are, um, they haven't been done yet, but the technologies to do this are now available. 
And another game changer was the LCROSS mission, where NASA recently crashed a spacecraft into the moon. It ejected a debris cloud, and we flew with another satellite through the debris cloud and measured that it was full of water ice, also carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide ice, and ammonia ices, or nitrogen compounds in the ice. And so hydrogen, carbon, and nitrogen were previously the only three elements that you needed that were not present on the moon, but now we know they're in vast quantities. It has been estimated that there's enough water ice on the moon that you could launch one space shuttle mission every day for a thousand years. And as my colleague here at the Kennedy Space Center said, now there is nothing that can't be made on the moon. So, um, one last thing that is a game changer. During the Constellation program, we've been developing technologies in order to utilize space resources. And this was a field test that we participated in up on a volcano in Hawaii, up on Mauna Kea. We were taking volcanic ash, pouring it into a device that would then move it into a chemical processor, and everything was robotic. It would move it into a chemical processor, use the solar energy to melt the soil, perform a chemical reaction to get oxygen out of it, and then we use that oxygen to fire a rocket. So we called the test dust to thrust. <laughs> and we've also tested these things in reduced gravity flights. So these are a couple of the people in my lab who are testing the ability to move soil in and out of chemical processors in lunar gravity. So, because of these game changers, we recently wrote a paper where we proposed a new approach to say that you really can start space industry and we can do it affordably and rapidly. And so the new idea was, let's not build a self-replicating factory on Earth so that we have to launch the entire factory. Let's evolve the factory on the moon a little bit at a time. That's the way that colonists do it here on Earth. When colonists came from Europe to North America, they didn't bring entire English factories on their ships. Instead, they brought axes. And they lived at a lower standard of living, and they lived with appropriate technology each step of the way until eventually American technology became at the same level of European technology. And so the idea is that you start out with appropriate technology. It doesn't have to be low mass or high tech because you're not going to launch it on the moon. You're going to make it on the moon. So who cares if it's big and clunky? It just needs to be easy to make in space. And the technologies that are going to make this possible don't need to be paid for by NASA. The robotics revolution, additive manufacturing revolution, these are already ongoing. And so all we need to do is spin in to the space program these things that others are already paying for. And the technologies are advancing exponentially, so let's not underestimate what's possible. So an example of, of appropriate technology, in 1620, the Colonists were living in crude houses like you see in the top, while the people in Europe were living in nice houses like you see in the bottom. Water pumps. When you want to take a water pump to an area that doesn't have the industrial base to maintain it, you need to, take, you need to give them a very, very simple water pump so that they can maintain it. And as time goes on, you can go from, pedal, from foot powered to pedal powered to gasoline powered and eventually gigantic water pumps. But you don't do it overnight. You evolve step by step as the industrial base in the local region develops with it. And so we've developed, we've um, laid out nominally seven generations of industry for the moon. They start out with teleoperation and they become more autonomous until eventually they achieve full autonomy, although that's not really necessary. We only need, um, we only need lizard-like artificial intelligence. We don't need to go all the way up to what um, Hans Maravec calls monkey-like. Um, the scale of industry, it starts out as imported hardware from the earth, and then the second generation, that those material, the hardware that it builds, is very crude fabrication and inefficient. But it has a greater throughput than the first because you build more pieces of equipment in the first generation. So the second generation can, can therefore even build more in the third. And then you go up from there. The materials that you make, you start out making just a few simple crude materials, but as you build more equipment on the moon, you, you advance the, the variety of things that can be made. And let me mention, in each generation, 
you make some of the hardware, you launch the missing pieces from Earth, and then you launch the robots that put it all together. And eventually you start making the robots on the moon too. You build the parts of the robots that you can, you launch the rest from the Earth. The previous generation puts together the next generation. And so over a period of six or seven or so generations, you become more and more sophisticated as you are making a larger and larger fraction of the materials on the moon. We, um, we reviewed the literature, which is a fairly deep literature on how to use lunar resources. So we reviewed all the different papers on how to make metals out of lunar soil, how to make plastics and rubber out of the lunar ice. Actually, there's not very much literature on that, but the metals, there's a vast literature. How to make solar cells on the moon, there have been several studies on that showing that it can be done. And based on a review of the literature and based on the hardware that we've actually developed and tested on Mauna Kea and elsewhere, we came up with just some nominal um, design point or some nominal characteristics of this system, the Generation 1, that we modeled. And we determined how much regolith per hour it would need to process and how many kilograms per hour in parts it would produce and how much energy it would use. And so I wrote a computer model and I won't go through the details of this. Let me just read the left-hand column. It's very simplistic. It's not intended to be definitive. Really the purpose of the model is to explore some of the key parameters. And since I'm speaking to physics students, I'm sure you understand the value of simple models to explore key parameters. If you put too much detail in before you understand the structure of the problem, then you just start fooling yourselves. So the idea here is to, to explore the fundamental aspects of industry in space. And after we understand the basics of it, then we can start developing more complex models. And the, another purpose of this was to attempt to demonstrate basic feasibility. It, it's intended to generate further interest in investigation, but it really does need a much larger study with more people. Um, not shown in that previous slide were some additional work that would be done in a few of the particular generations. In generation three, we plan to build 80 metric tons of construction equipment. And then in generation four, that equipment would build dust-free laboratories so that you could start making electronics. Generation five began stockpiling materials so that we could send this industry to the asteroid belt. And then generation six used the stockpiled materials to build a, a fleet of six spacecraft, 20 metric tons each, plus 12 tons of payload each, plus all of the propellants so that you could take this industry to the main asteroid belt. And the, the main idea here is that we use the moon because it's nearby, it has ice, and that makes it extremely convenient. But the ice is limited. You, you really want to have an industry that's going to be millions of times what you can do on the Earth. That's where the benefit really comes in, the paradigm shift to going to the next level of civilization. And you can't do that if you're using just the limited ice that's on the moon. I said you could launch one space shuttle a day for a thousand years, but if you had an industry a million times that of the Earth, it would be gone in no time. So the real goal here is to start industry nearby the Earth, and as soon as you've got it up and running and got the necessary autonomy, then you send it off to the asteroid belt where the real resources are available. And literally there are billions of times of everything that we need uh, here on the Earth available there in the asteroid belt. And um, so the modeling shows, uh, this is showing how much mass you need to launch to the moon in each of these seven generations. And you can see it's uh, about 10 or 20 tons of hardware each generation until finally in generation 6.0, you don't have to launch anything to the moon ever again because at that point you're making everything. The red graph shows what would happen if you did not make electronics on the moon. And you can see that that starts to grow exponentially and you would be launching thousands of tons of electronics to the moon because the industry is growing so large. So that's a demonstration that you need to make electronics on the moon. The, the uh, green line shows what would happen if you make everything except the computer chips. And if you continued this out generation seven, eight, nine, you would see that that would be 
a line that continues to grow exponentially parallel to the red line. And so even just the computer chips would be too expensive to launch from the Earth. And so we took the approach that you need to even build computer chips on the moon. And there's no reason why you can't do that because robotics will be able to put together the lithography machines that we have on the Earth. Robotics are going to be that adept at putting things together. And so if you can make the parts, then you can assemble the parts, and then you can make the computer chips. There's no reason why we can't go for that. Um, the power, we use the, the published papers showing the efficiency of solar cells that you can make very crudely out of lunar soil. We assume that there's no technology advancement. We use just the crude cells that are available today. And we, we, uh, c we put so much into making solar cells that we had a factor of 30 times more solar power available than the industry would need all throughout its growth. That's actually a conservative assumption. By putting more of our industry than we need to into making solar cells, we have retarded the growth of the other aspects of the industry. So the industry could have been more efficient and grown faster if we didn't make all these excess solar cells. So this was an element of conservatism, just to make sure we weren't claiming too much. Um, the model also shows that, indeed, the industry does grow exponentially. The red graph, which is to the, the right-hand axis, shows that by the end of these seven generations, you'll have 100,000 robots on the moon that would be assembling parts. And the, I, I'm colorblind. Is that blue or purple, the other graph? Is that blue? Blue. Okay, so the blue graph, which is the left-hand axis, shows that you'll have something like 50,000 or 60,000 tons of hardware on the moon. And let me just go back. If you add up how much hardware you have to launch to the moon in each of these six generations, it adds up to about 42 tons. So by launching 42 tons, you end up with 60,000 tons. Pretty good. Um, the, one of the key technology challenges is 3D printing. Right now, 3D printers are not fast enough to make this happen. They need to improve. You need to get up to about 0.3 kilogram per hour. Right now, they're not there. Um, you could have more printers per set of hardware on the moon, but that's a limiting strategy because if you start approach having an infinite number of 3D printers, then you're limited to the self-reproduction rate of the printers. How fast can a printer print its own mass? And that becomes the rate that you can reproduce the industry. So it can't be any faster than that rate. Um, so we do need some advancement in 3D printing technology, but it's really no problem because all the people that are working in this technology area are expecting within a decade we're going to be well more than the target that we need to achieve. And um, furthermore, you don't need to do everything by 3D printing. You could print ca uh, casts, molds, and then do casting for the majority of the things that you make. So there are other ways to solve this problem. The um, total amount of hardware that's made on the moon um, in terms of actual years instead of generations. It, it depends on the 3D printing speed. So looking at different speeds of 3D printers, let's just be conservative and say that we only achieve um, 0.25 kilograms per hour. So that's the square with the long dashes. Um, it's the fourth graph from the left. And you can see that, that you complete all seven generations of industry in less than 30 years. But if you can get the, the speed up to like 20, uh, 0.2 kilograms per hour, then you can achieve all this industry in about 20 years. So this is an extraordinarily fast amount of time to, to get full self-sustaining industry on the moon. Um, the number of robonauts you would make during that amount of time is shown in the bottom half. It's also a function of where you're located on the moon. So here we're showing the mass of hardware that you make and the number of robots you make in each of the six generations as a function of the duty cycle during a lunar month. So if you are near the poles of the moon, you can get sunlight for about 70% of the month. If you are near the equator, you will only get enough sunlight for about 40% of the month. And so therefore, 
it makes about an order of magnitude, a factor of 10 difference in how fast your factories can work and how much, uh, how much they can reproduce during those seven generations. So it's remarkable that just a, a uh, less than a factor of two difference in the duty, the operating time produces an order of magnitude difference in what they produce by the end of seven generations. Um, minimizing the launch mass. So everything I've discussed so far is assuming that these factories are working just as fast as they can. However, you can actually get the total cost of this industry, the total amount of hardware that you launch from Earth, much, much less if instead of building as much hardware as you can every generation, you only build one new set of hardware. So one factory in generation one builds only one more factory in generation two, and so forth. If you do it that way, the modeling shows that you have much less hardware that you have to launch to the moon, and it adds up to a total of only 12 tons. So it's incredibly affordable. 12 tons spread out over 20 years, that's chump change. There's no reason we can't afford to do this. So um, beyond generation six, as I mentioned, when you get industry started on the moon, the next phase is to move it to the asteroid belt where the best resources are. For example, the asteroid belt has literally a billion times more metal than the crust of the Earth. So after 20 years in the asteroid belt, this industry would then have one million times the industrial capacity of the entire United States. And after another 10 years, it could grow to have a billion times the capacity of the entire United States. And this is where it starts to get beyond what we can imagine from our current way of living. You have to really think hard, wow, what would you do? What could you do or what would you want to do with a billion times our ability to produce goods and services? Hmm. Well, here's some scenarios. We could start the global relief effort. So we could take all factories off the earth make the earth a great big national uh, or a global park, a nature preserve where humans and animals all live in, <laughs> in peace and happiness and we just land everything that we need from space. Um, another uh, possibility, and uh, by the way, the easiest thing to bring back from space is energy, just beaming it down. If you can make the, the uh, solar collectors in space outside the shadow of the earth, then you can have solar energy 24 hours a day at no cost. If you don't have to build the power beaming stations, then it doesn't cost anything. So we could have abundant free energy. And by the way, let me just inject right here this idea. People say that, sometimes people say, if you just give humans more and more resources, we will just reproduce, reproduce, and we will blow up our population out of control. But that's not what the data tell us. The data tell us that whenever a region of the world becomes affluent, their birth rate stabilizes. And so if you want the birth rate of humanity to stabilize, you really need to give abundant energy and abundant style of living to everybody in the world so that everybody can afford to get an education rather than spending all their life working hard out in the field as children and, and so forth. So um, the, by bringing free energy down from space, we could actually stabilize the world population. Um, the Great Migration is going the other way. Instead of bringing the resources down to people, let's take the people up to colonies in space. If you had a billion times the ability to produce goods and services, you could literally terraform planets like Mars. Or we could build big traveling world ships, gigantic ships that have an entire world of people in them to travel to other planets. And we could send spore ships that would be a spore of Earth industry, of our solar system industry, to to colonize other solar systems before we arrive so that when we arrive at another star we already have a billion times Earth's industry in that solar system and the planets are already being terraformed. So there is a possibility now of really colonizing the galaxy. But the foundation is a more humble approach that's let's just put enough industry in the solar system so that if we destroy life on Earth then we can restart it from there. Another idea is the space endowment. It's another more humble approach. Instead of having this great big industry in space, if we just had enough to have a fantastic university in space where everybody is fully funded, and if you want to go live in space and do some gigantic um, super collider project, the robots will build it for you and you can go do it. 
Um, and then there's a negative aspect to all this. The technologies are coming, whether we push it or not, and sooner or later, anybody will be able to start industry in space. And when that happens, they might do it poorly. They might create a system in space where the robots take over, for example. No. Or, or they might create a system where they, they have such big armies that they've made in space that they execute hegemony over the earth and we forever become their slaves. And since industry in space can grow exponentially, there's no way you could ever catch up. So the negative mm -hmm. side is we want to make sure that the good people of the world do this first so that we can keep the bad things from happening. <coughs> and, um, one more thing about how to look at this. When we get this industry in space, we can think of, think of it as like an ecosphere that has been custom designed for the solar system. It, and another way to look at it is think it, you can think of the solar system as becoming one big living cell, moving resources back and forth and having an internal um, ability to produce energy so that this living cell now um, is able to reproduce by sending out copies of itself to other star systems. And another way to look at it is we're not talking about putting smokestacks all throughout the solar system. When people hear the word industry, they think of the negative aspects. But if, you've, if you're on your way to having a million or a billion times the industry of Earth, that's far more than you actually need. So we would not have the economic motivation to take shortcuts and pollute everything. So rather than being pollution in the solar system, this would be a system that beautifies the solar system. We could have architects and artists working their entire life designing beautiful cities to go on Pluto or sculptures that are going to be going into cities on Mars. And um, when the first humans arrived in North America, they didn't find a barren continent, just barren rocks with sunlight and water. Instead, they found forests and grasses. It was beautified by the function of life breaking down the rocks, creating topsoil, growing plants, and then animals being able to live among the plants. And so right now we don't have that happening in the solar system. Anywhere you go in space, it's just barren regolith. But we would put the equivalent of life, the robot equivalent of life, into the solar system to begin processing the regolith and the atmospheres just like what happened on Earth in order to beautify it. And that would allow us to live at the top of a food chain, which is what we are adapted to do. And so that way, when we go anywhere in space, we're not just struggling to survive. We would be finding environments that have been designed um, for us so that we can live there comfortably. And this would enable us to do great things, as I've mentioned already, terraforming, colonies, science and arts, and interstellar travel. Hey, Phil? Yes. Hey, uh, let's uh, let's pause right now or quickly jump to the, the ending so we can have some time for I'm, Okay, I'm on the last chart right now. Okay. So the um, cost and benefit is that we could develop and launch 20 to 60 tons to the moon and operate it for 20 years and um, the launch cost would be a negligible fraction of the cost. My estimate is that this would cost about a third of the price of the International Space Station. The benefit is that we would move from a type 1 to a type 2 civilization, solve world economic problems, make our existence safe in the solar system, brilliant possibilities for the future, and move us toward a type 3 civilization. And so the summary is that we're right now nearing the limits of a type 1 civilization. There's a barrier that we're starting to feel the squeeze of, um, but we, can, we do have the ability to leap over that barrier. So that was my talk, and I'd be glad to take questions. Fantastic. Okay, um, Henderson, you want to Yeah, make sure they've got... They Henderson, audio. can you hear me? We can hear you. Can you hear us? Yes, yes. we can. Do you have any questions? Uh, what, what method would you propose would be the easiest way to move materials from, say, the moon to the Earth? I mean, launching rockets is still expensive regardless of how you look at it. So would there be perhaps a cheaper way to do it? To move materials from the moon to the Earth? Yes, like manufactured materials and things. Yeah, so um, it, it took me a while to wrap my head around this, but um, costs are only paid to humans. So if you analyze 
any any um, business, you've got a material cost, an energy cost, facility cost, and a labor cost. But the energy cost, you're paying an energy company, and they've got the same breakdown: labor, human materials, and so forth. And so, if you write if you write this as a chain of um, we've got these costs. There's labor and non-labor. Look at the lab the non-labor costs. That can be further broken down into labor and non-labor. And then the non-labor side further broken down, labor, non-labor. And so it becomes an infinite series. And the um, a fraction of one raised to the infinite power vanishes. So looking at it that way, you can see that ultimately all the money is really just labor. Uh, you know, we don't pay money to the earth or to the sun for materials. So um, if you had a robotic industry that was self-sustaining, then once you reach the point that it's self-sustaining, from that point on, it's free. You don't have to pay anybody for anything. And so anything that would be considered not economic in our economy, is um, th that analysis no longer applies. So you could have your industry building spaceships, making the propellants, sending them to Earth, and it's entirely free. There's no cost whatsoever. Now you can talk about efficiency. It may be more efficient to do it some ways versus other ways. But in terms of economics, the, the money aspect becomes irrelevant at that point. There, um, look at it this way too. When Puritans from England came to Massachusetts, well, they were already Indians. Let me go back even further. When the Native Americans first came to North America across the Bering Land Bridge, they found that the, co the continent had already been transformed and there was food they could scoop up off the ground and eat. And um, they didn't have to pay life to do that. Life did it because it was, it was just that way. And so if we pay one time up front the cost of developing this industry in space, once that cost is paid, everything after that is free. It'll transform the solar system. It'll move things around. Um, of course, we're going to want to keep control over it. <laughs> we're going to want to have some cost, some fraction of our population working with the industry in space to continue to evolve it and continue to direct it. But um, I don't really see there being any economic problem with moving things from space to Earth. Uh, there, one of the ways you can do it is you make heat shields out of dirt, and you you have to build propulsion systems to launch it off the moon. Other people have talked about using mass drivers to fling it off the moon. Um, then you re-enter it in the Earth's atmosphere using this big chunk of rock that you made as your heat shield. Um, so there are, there are some simple ways like that. Or you can just build r really fancy spaceships, land them on the Earth, and when they get down here, you melt them down and use the metal for something else. There's some ideas about it. Hey Phil, I got a quick question for you. Yep. So, in terms of your your model, uh, did it include any um, uh, part failure rate uh, to to basically account for things that will break or things that will you know? Because if we're going to be running these guys out pretty hard steady the whole time, things are going to break. Uh, right. Does the model have a simple decay rate in there for parts and a failure rate? How does that impact the predictions? Yeah, so I was pretty crude, as I mentioned, but what I did do was I assumed that every generation you completely retire the previous generation. Ah, okay. Yeah, so that was, again, I think kind of conservative, and I was trying to be conservative. What I didn't want was for people to discard our analysis and say we were too... Um, we were too flippant and it really won't work because of this or because of that. And so by putting a lot of excess conservative in, conservatism into it, we tried to make it immune from most criticism. Okay. Um, also, we put a crudity factor into it. So in the early generations, everything weighs two and a half times as much as it really should weigh. And then as the generations proceed, we reduced the crudity factor until eventually everything became one-to-one -one with the way we would make it here on Earth. Excellent. All right, we've got another class trying to get into this room, but there's no reason for us to actually close down the hangout. We can move to another location, That's at right. least in this location. So, Henderson, if you guys have got any questions, uh, jump in, and we're just going to move physically to a new location, but you guys keep carrying on. I only have about five minutes, and then oh. I've got to run. Um, but I could, can, I've got to run and jump in my van pool in five minutes. But I could, <laughs> I, I could continue by phone if you would want me to. 
Well, um, I would say, how about we have you back uh, maybe next semester, and we'll do this again with some updated um, analysis and new projects and maybe some shots of some hardware. Sure, that'd be fine. And you know what? I could do this anytime. If you want to just, even this semester, if you want to just have a Q&A session sometime informally, I'd be glad to do that. If, you've, if your um, physics club meets in the evenings, I could do that. It's no problem. I'd be glad to. Okay. Awesome, Phil. Well, we really appreciate you taking some time out of your day to chat with us here in Arkansas. Okay, great. All right. Well, you all have a great day up there, okay? All right. We'll do Thank it. you very much. Thank you. So this video will be uploaded, automatically uploaded to our YouTube channel. I'll have it edited and ready to go probably by the end of the week, and I'll shoot you an email and let you review it. <coughs> And then okay. I'll send it out to where everybody can see it. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye. bye.